morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you are, and welcome to the latest edition of Free Thought Hour. Now, I've got some a slightly disappointing news for you at the moment because Professor Brian J. Ford, fantastic guy, hasn't turned up. <laughs> and, and our guest has arrived. So <laughs> fantastic. That is brilliant. Brian, welcome. Well, my dear chap. How the devil are I you? I owe you every apology. I can give you the best of excuses. I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> I said to Jen, I, I just got back in and I said, what were we supposed to be doing tonight? So <laughs> yes. my, my apologies. <laughs> Don't worry. And Mr. So, very nice to see you too. We're, we're so glad to have you here because you're such an interesting person. I want you to tell us about your life. How did you get to be? Brian, Professor Brian J. Ford, oh, freelance, God. freelance scientist. Eh? Yeah. I mean, you're, you're well, not. I can, tell you, I, I can tell you that very easily. Uh, the first is that before I became a student, I was already a newspaper columnist. I lived in Cardiff in South Wales and was opposed to going to university. I thought university was not a good idea. And in the end, I decided about a week before they opened <clears throat> that I would go. But I was by this time already a newspaper columnist. I'd been to see the editor of the South Wales Echo, which at the time had a readership of about three quarters of a million people. I wrote him and I said, this was in September 1959. And I said, you're going to have uh, science as the big issue of the next uh, few decades. And there aren't any articles in newspapers on science. And I'd like to write one. Right. So he invited me in and he said to me, you can have a 200 word article every Friday called mm. Science and You. Great. And I want you to write the first five. I'll pay you a guinea each. Would be now about 50 quid. And if they're any good, we'll publish them. If not, we'll bin them, but I'll pay you anyway. Wow. Which I thought was a deal. good deal. So I wrote the articles and I sent them in and I heard nothing. And I thought, oh, well, obviously that was no good. And I used to go to the reference library to see the news, the evening newspaper. I couldn't buy one. I was a student. So I went mm. to the evening newspaper in the library and I turned the pages, starting at the back. And I turned mm. through the paper and quite suddenly there was an article. The first in a new series, specially written for the Echo by me. And I banged the newspaper shut with embarrassment and everything on the front starting today our new science column Ooh. and the reason it became brian j ford is this jack had rung me up when i sent the articles in and he said uh i see you signed your articles bj ford and i said yes i always do sign everything bj ford he said what's your first name lad and i said brian and he said oh right okay but then i i said yes he said okay lad and he rang off so that's why i became brian J Ford, because once you were in printers out, you couldn't really change it. Yes, anyway, yes. Oh. Before get the university term started, I went to see the the head of uh, biology, and I said, uh, "I think I'll come as a student." And he said, "No, you apply a year ahead." And I said, "Yes, right. but uh, one could apply now, couldn't one?" And he said, "Well, all, all the places are full." I said, "Oh, come on, they're big lecture theatres; not every seat is full." And he said, "Well, you haven't got a grant." So I then went down to the uh, education office and said, could I go and see the director of education? Mm. And they asked me and they thought they were going to write an article about him. And I said, I want a university grant. And he said, will you apply a year ahead? And I said the same thing to him. The result was they coughed up the grant. They coughed up the place. And I started. But in my second year, I went to see my head of department. And I said, I don't get this academic stuff. I said, you've been making me learn things for the last year that I've known for years and years. I've been studying all, all, all yeah. my teaching. Mm. And it seems to me that you study a certain thing, you get a PhD, and then when you're 90 years old, you're the world's greatest ever certain thingologist. And he said, yes, that's how the system works. I said, but I don't want to do that. <laughs> I might want to work on a subject for a, a week or possibly work on a subject for two years with three other subjects he said, no, no, you can't do it. i said i might want to work in biology or astronomy or physics or what if i get an idea in some other discipline yes and he said you cannot work between 
disciplines. <laughs> you decide, you choose your discipline, and you stick with that. Mm. So I said, oh, tell that to you, Glena, an organism which is considered both a plant yes, yes, yes. and an animal. Yes. Uh, and so I said, I'm not going to. And so with all the arrogance of youth, I stormed out, rented uh, a little building in Pilar along the coast, and set up my own lab. And oh. uh, my last formal academic qualification would be A-level biology. <laughs> I didn't complete my degree. And all of my uh, associations since have been purely on the basis of my published work. So there you are, in a nutshell, the wow. life of Brian up to the age of 20. Wow. Brian, can I, I, this is so interesting. So we haven't met. Do I call you Brian or Dr. Ford or Professor Ford? Brian would be absolutely adequate. <laughs> well, we haven't met. I, I'm, I'm the co-host and I'm in South Africa in the Western Cape and I'm Tarsha Duplessis. Uh, I, I'm uh, a couple years the, the junior of you and John. So, uh, and I find, I find your story absolutely fascinating. The, so I have a question and a comment. Firstly, if you were unfortunate enough to have been a a school child today you would have probably been diagnosed with adhd hyperactivity attention deficit disorder and you would have probably been um prescribed some sort of ritalin or some drug like that so i'm i'm very grateful that you did go to school when you went to school because um that's the first thing and then you know as as a, a relative youngster myself so you say that you started a newspaper column before you began your studies. So, in, in, I mean, I went to school in the 80s, um, in the late 1980s, there was my high school education, and we used encyclopedias for research. And if, if when I came to university in 1991, we had microfish. So how did you do research on all these topics? Um, my, microfish, it, my God. That, that really dates us both, doesn't it? Yes. <laughs> By the way, uh, let me send my best wishes to South Africa. Um, uh, I have visited South Africa only once, but greatly enjoyed it. What I liked most about South Africa was the lift going up Table, uh, table Mountain. Yes. It's a, it's a cylindrical lift, and it rotates as it goes up so that everybody gets a chance to the view. That must be unique in the world. I thought that was wonderful. When was this? Um, Sorry, I, I, I need to know how long ago because they have a brand new one now. Um, oh, it would be about um, eight or ten years ago. Okay, I think the new one because the one they the last time I went up there, uh, they had one that the floor is also transparent. So, oh, no, that wasn't. <laughs> My yeah, goodness, so, so, that would cut so, down the number of people willing to go in it. <laughs> it's it's yeah I, we actually hiked up there um uh so uh it's it's a beautiful oh, we it's hiked up world, the the botany up there is unique nothing like what it's like at the bottom of the mountain it's quite an extraordinary mm. place yes i i think if i'm not mistaken i think there's something like 200 plant species that only uh grow on top of okay. table mountain um it, it's, it's more an than amazing place yes, i mean you just yes. stand there in this mist of the clouds Definitely cleared while I was there, which was rather nice. But to stand there in the mist and to see all of these incredible plants, lots of Rufobiaceae, I seem to recall, and and it was just an amazing environment. I couldn't believe it. Yes, yes, it went, and and we. I'm gonna say, I later went around one of the townships, and um, uh, sat in conditions of utter squalor, with twenty or so of the uh, township elders, talking about um, about politics and about race and about education and the future of the world. And I thought, you know, any of these guys would be a perfect fit at high table at a university in England. They had such depth of wisdom, such incredibly mellifluous and literary English. And yet they were people who possessed nothing and were living in conditions of utter muddy, smelly squalor. It's quite extraordinary how uh, how you will find great brains in places yeah. where you least expect to find them. Yeah. Was this in, in Cape Town? Was it in Kailicha? Yes, Do you remember? I can't recall where it was, but it was from Cape Town. It, it, would, it would probably be in Kailicha. Um, that's the biggest uh, 
township uh, in, in um, it's close to the airport it's in fact it, on the drive to the airport it's right mm. next to the road so but you know yes. I, i've also been into uh, when i stayed in mumbai i always go and walk around the slums and there mm -hmm. you see these again these incredibly uh, deprived and depressing environments yes but the kidneys are all immaculately clean their clothes mm. are all sparkling white most of them speak english those that do speak better english than you hear in england and yes. they're all dazzling with little bright brains it's an extraordinary mm. world we live in yes mm. well i want so, to talk to you sorry okay. sorry john go ahead go ahead thank you i want to talk to you a bit about education because what you did back then in 1950 whenever couldn't be done today you couldn't march up to a new university and say i'm going to join you whether you're whether you filled your places or not and you wouldn't be able to get a grant either that's that's all gone it's borrowing money now or working your way through college so the world has changed and not necessarily for the better but also the route you painted of how an academic is expected to progress from you know what they call undergraduate degrees now i think that's a contradiction in terms because you graduate <laughs> you can't have an undergraduate degree and then mm. then into higher degrees and eventually phds and become increasingly narrowly specialized so you end up being the world's expert in limnology or something you know and, and that is so stifling uh, believe I, me you talk to somebody about limnology and they're going to speak to tell you of the specific aspect of the specific organs yes. of the specific species yes, yes, yes. which they study yes a friend of mine studied sapia nemoralis <laughs> ah yes <laughs> Male. Yeah, one particular help, me, help me i'm 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 illiterate i'm i'm just a literature um graduate so what what, what is what is that is it a... is a small snail shell about yes. that much in diameter with a, a dark dark spirals running around it very attractive yes, yes. it's it's found on the chalk downlands here in southern england but what i wanted to talk to you about is what can we do about this because there's so much going on that's going to upset traditional education. Mm. It started way back with the Open University, when, when that was sort of the instigation of studying from home. But yeah. now, thanks to technology, everybody has access to pretty much all the wisdom in the world. And they don't need to attend a school or go into a class of you know, similarly aged and abilitied um, pupils and so what are we doing what are these buildings that we call schools what are these uh, curriculums that require people to be in a group what is it all about anymore i can tell you exactly what it is uh, schools what? have become a nationalized babysitting service for working parents mm -hmm. that's all they are we don't teach children anything important in school we teach them things about which they need to know a bit like mm. shakespeare and algebra but we never teach kids what they need to know we never teach kids how to wire a plug how to mow a lawn how to run a flat how to iron a blouse how to mend a sewing machine how to service how, how... your humble dryer we don't learn, teach them how to drive a car how to maintain a bike how to mend a puncture how how we don't teach them apart from anything else how to be people mm. uh, currently currently because of all the minority sexuality that is suddenly ridding its head they're now teaching kids in school things like um, drag art and transsexuality and the fact that there may be 40 sexes i never heard any such poppycock in all of my life what is curious though is that although we're now teaching all of these minority current fashionable preoccupations nobody ever thought to teach children how to be nice boys and girls mm. they were never taught how to be friendly how to be honest no young mm. girl has ever been taught how to be a creative caring consummately clever professional woman no young man has ever been taught how to be a thoughtful dignified constructive member of society mm. you see signs in shops now saying 
please don't abuse our staff yes uh, you see kids now on uh, uh, on social media particularly on tiktok actually filming beating each other up in order yes. to try and get the following yes. whoever told them that beating each other up was bad kids are never taught mm. the things they need to know in school they're never taught how to live life as an adult all they're taught is the traditional crap that people get taught all the time and now of course we have a system where they're being encouraged to study in england and uh, uh, particularly to study maths till they're 18. no 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 you need to know arithmetic geometry would be helpful algebra is totally pointless and they don't even get taught euclidean geometry anymore which is full of clever puzzles that kids would simply love to understand no we should teach kids about shakespeare uh, but what about teaching about Dylan Thomas? They rarely come across him. Wonderful writer. Shakespeare was writing scripts for EastEnders. Yes, yes. Shakespeare, and so was Charles Dickens. They were the popular script writers of their time. Yes, yes they were. 200 yes. times somebody said they're going to devote in school months and months and months to teaching all about EastEnders scripts. You think, well, why on earth are we doing this? It's not part of our life. Yes. Teach kids what they need to know instead of teachers saying turn off all your phones say make sure your phones are fully charged because you're going to need them yes, in yes, yes, yes. Oh, uh, brian you know what um i actually started in COVID. i started to homeschool my youngest son who's 16 now and by the way he's doing the cambridge curriculum and i took him out of school well it was COVID, so so that he was at home and then when the school sort of reopened on an ad hoc basis i just said i'm not sending him back and i started to teach the, him at home and before i knew it i had a, a, a about nine kids that i taught at home and what you say now is something that i've known I, i'm a qualified educator as well and you know what i taught them i taught them things like how how to how to change the wheel on a um on a car i taught sure. them all i taught all the boys and the girls how to read a recipe how to cook certain meals how to sew on a button i i made them so face masks boys girls everybody and it was so interesting to me to see that if you expose kids to learning these things that, that they that they see in their world um those who have a natural propensity for for example mechanics some of the boys not all of the boys some of the boys when i taught them how to sew with the sewing machine they asked me can we open it up and see how it works and i said yes, yes of yes. course <laughs> look at it open it up you can't break well don't break it and it's so interesting that the one thing that language teachers doesn't i've never come across in either afrikaans or english which are the main languages taught in south african schools that they teach kids how to use google they don't teach them how to formulate a proper search phrase mm -hmm. so what's the use of knowing about shakespeare but you don't know how to formulate a search phrase that will lead you in the right direction when you want information about x y or z um you know, you know what the youngsters are always asking me they'll say hey pops i can't find out about such and such did so and so ever actually do whatever it was and i'll do the search and find it straight away because exactly. as you rightly say they've no keyword training yes. from school so school yeah. is just a babysitting service and and mm. all they have to do is to memorize all this stuff and then regurgitate it they're never yes. taught for example how to think they're only made to to obey but the thing about going on to university john is and this is very important that everybody understands it the point of it is to get children accustomed to being deeply in debt the reason they go to university and i said this at a, a dinner at cambridge uh, to the students not long ago and they came in standing ovation bless their little heart yeah. i said the reason kids go to university is firstly to postpone the evil day when you have to get a job secondly get away from home so that you can get laid and high and play loud music as much as you want without your parents in this thing. And thirdly, because of the fact that it gives you the chance to have subsidized bars and subsidized entertainments and meet lots of people who might help you to get laid. That's the reason they go. They then end up with 50,000 pounds of debt. Yes. And meanwhile, anybody who didn't go to university, like me, I mean, by the time my friends were graduating, I'd been on BBC television. I was yes. writing a regular one. I was making yes. decent. I had a reputation, status, and an income 
whilst they were still in university learning all yes. this stuff. Yes, yes. Well, I want to ask your opinion about the way things are going, because the modern world, whereas education started way back in the Victorian era as a way of getting workers good enough to be employable in industrial factories, it's moved on, and the, the latest developments with AI means that everybody can, can study at the speed they want, into the areas they want, and I'd like to get your opinion about that. Where are we going with that development? Well, it's not, of course, true to say that education started in the Victorian era. It started a lot longer than that. I mean, mm. in fact, the reason that we have the long summer holidays tradition mm. is goes yeah. right back to the 14th, 14th and 15th century. Yeah, when yes, the kids yes. had to be around to take part in the mm. harvest. That's the reason yes. for it. Uh, <laughs> it, and, became, and, and it became ubiquitous in Victorian. Of what we've now got... <laughs> It yeah. is 21st century kids being taught by 20th century teachers based mm. on a 19th century curriculum, yeah. based to 18th century ideas of schooling, which were mm. rooted in 17th century and earlier social yeah. patterns of behavior. It's totally yes, yes. irrelevant. There's no point whatever, mm. apart from mm. being babies, there is no point whatever in kids going to school. And, and the fact that you trained your kids at home, the fact that you did home school, brilliant idea. Our children, well, not let me not boast about my children, but let me just say that from my point of view, I learned far more out of school than I yeah. ever did. In. Mm. We would always take the kids away for a week around the mm. Med or to North Africa or something during term time, because there was right. there was an Education Act which was replaced a few years ago, which allowed parents to take their kids out yes. for a pre arranged. Yes annual yes. holiday from term yes. and when we were there they would go on the local transport they would learn mm. some of the language they would eat the local mm. food they would mm. learn more in a week in morocco than they would mm. ever have learned if they'd spent that week in school yeah nowadays you'd get prosecuted for that for keeping yeah, them away from school. Yes. yes well worth the fine well yes. well um brian i i've i've had this um thing about real how one learns and what one when a anybody not only children actually learns and it's when you're doing things so nobody learns anything when you're sitting on your butt listening to something that that you know you're going to have to be tested on so that you can get a mark that's not how anybody learns you might retain some of the memory long enough to get even a hundred percent for the test but what have you really learned everything that i've learned in my life was through experience and with experience, oh, right. I include reading a book because oh. uh, we, and and I'm when the kids. So I now have a homeschool tutor center, and th the first thing that kids are amazed at when they when they begin learning with us is that, that you know they sort of have their phones surreptitiously sort of hidden behind the desk. I'm like, where's your phone? Where's your tablet? Put it out there. You yes. have to read. You have to look things up. Um, yes. You have to. I'm constantly telling them. Google this, Google that, look this Ooh. up, look this up. Yes. And yes. Um, I'm, I'm constantly telling them to watch this YouTube video and that YouTube video. And, uh, you know, we, we have to rethink the way we, we educate our children for the modern era because it's just... Ah, well, now, two things here. First thing I'd mention is that four-year-old Alfie was over here today. And where was Alfie? He was up a 15-foot ladder. Um, a five meter ladder up on the roof of our barn clipping off ivy and he was up there every time he moved he's, he made sure that the secretaries were shut and locked he had his gardening gloves on he, was, mm. he worked away for the best part of an hour not just snick snick oh can we have a chocolate bar he understands exactly what work was and when he yes. finished he came down and put all his things neatly away mm. but when, exactly. when when artificial intelligence really gets going though we won't need workers, will we? Long term. It's not artificial intelligence. There's no such no, thing. It's, yeah. it's digital automation. That's all it is. They've had yes. articles saying, isn't it wonderful that mm. uh, this uh, that uh, chat GPT can actually sit an exam and pass it. Wow, that shows that artificial intelligence is as good as a person. No, it doesn't. No. When a person sits an exam, they sit there in this stultifying atmosphere, terrified that they're going to fail, 
and they had to recall everything out of their brains. Mm. Chat GPT has no brain. It simply yes. has access to all the digital information anywhere in the world. So yes. of course it can pass the bloody exam because yes. in a nanosecond it can look up the answers to anything. But yes. it is digital automation. When the Lumiere brothers in 1897 showed their film of the train arriving at La Ciotat, the station in France, members of the audience got up and ran out to find yes. the yes. yes, because yes, they yes. Couldn't, couldn't believe it. there was a yes. train coming up. We're the same now with AI. We're saying, yes. oh, God, the train is like, no, it's, it's digital automation. Hardly yes. anything that happens in the world has ever been digitized. Yes. All the textbooks may have been, or yes. a lot of them have been. But the yes. things that happen, why you fall in love, why you get hiccups, why you yawn, you know, mm. all the things that go on within self, none of that is amenable to digitization. No, no. The digital no. environment that AI has access to is mm. a gazillion part of what happens in the world. It's an irrelevance. And that's nothing to do with intelligence. It mm. is digital automation. And Brian, going, John, John, I know, John, I have to ask Brian this because um, the, the, the thing about learning, to me, true learning involves the ability to be creative. What do you say about that? I want to use the analogy. So I'm a keen crocheter and I, I will, so when I see some, a pattern that I like, I will, or a new stitch, I will look at a YouTube video and I will learn how to make that stitch. But then the true learning and application to me happens when I adapt that stitch and all the other stitches that I know and all the ideas that are in my head and I make some something that has never been made before. To me, I, I, can't, I don't see artificial intelligence being able to do that, um, not in the way that, that there's, there's a creativity element. Um, do you think AI will ever get to that point where it can actually be creative in, in that way? Well, in the sense that, um, that crochet is a, 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 a repeatable and digitizable process, yes, I'm sure it will. Uh, I've never done crochet. It's, it's very difficult, though. I was taught embroidery, and I was taught embroidery at school when I was eight. And I became quite good at embroidery. We were also taught how to cook. The British the newspapers are full of articles saying how kids are not properly educated and people mm. don't know how to cook meals. And I think, when were they mm. ever taught it in school? When I was in school, I was taught in Ladbrook School in Potter's Bar, north of London, when I was about nine years old. I was taught how you make pastry and pasta. Mm. We made our mm. own spaghetti. Mm. We, I, I, and to this day, I'll go and make short crust and flaky and very I can I can do all the pastries to this day because I was taught when I was nine nobody mm. is taught that anymore these days I mean it is utterly bizarre and you mentioned crochet people would say think of Nigel he's upstairs he's writing computer code oh he's so gifted and there's granny in the corner sitting knitting a cable knit sweater and it all comes out and I would say yes but wait a moment just look at granny's knitting pattern and mm. what is it it's mm. code mm. <laughs> the fact that it's written as a knitting pattern that the way <laughs> it has subroutines and layers and mm. and a whole matrix of arguments essentially mm. it's the same as writing computer code yes, yes. well the first well, grandma's the first, got in her head is an algorithm yes yes the first uh, computers copied what had previously been used for manufacturing carpets what was that called it's a french name the jacquard loom the jacquard that's right yep. 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 so what we've got now i've i've heard chat gpt described as a stochastic parrot because <laughs> all it's doing no. no no it's not that's wrong a parrot repeats what you tell it chat gpt invents stuff about a month ago i was asked uh, mm. somebody said we need an up-to-date cv so i thought oh shit. so i typed i opened chat gpt and i said write a brief cv of brian j ford mm. and it went brian j ford is a blah 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 i've written and, got it. and then it said 
he has won several awards. I don't think these awards even exist. He had written several, <laughs> but all the titles of the books I'd written, and, and not, not only had I not written them, but books with that title don't exist. <laughs> so I had a PhD from London University. Now, the point is, some other co is going to look me up by using this, yeah. Yeah. this digital system, and they're going to be told that, and they're going to start saying, oh, he's got a PhD from London University, and someone's going to say, where you get that from? It's online. No, it isn't online. It's nowhere online. It's invented by chat gpt which intelligently thought that that might be right but mm. no it was wrong it's a complete lie now parents mm. don't lie parents repeat that's the difference yes they, they don't knowingly lie if they've been taught to say a lie they'll repeat it <laughs> but that means chat they won't just invent something they've never heard no uh, that, that means chat gpt is human because it can lie <laughs> <laughs> No, it doesn't. It has been taught to lie by the humans who set it up <laughs> to lie. That's the point. Yeah. No, no, what, what chat GPT does is looks at a word and says, what's the next word? Oh, here's a likely next word. And after that, it goes, here's another likely next word. It's predicting the next word. That's I'm not much going to um, decry the, the splendid complexity of the algorithms they wrote for chat GPT. Um, I mean, if you ask it something like, I don't know, the history of crochet or something, and, and it has been so wonderfully programmed, so ingeniously programmed, mm. that it, mas it masters vernacular English and will mm. chat to you. And you really get caught up with the fact because yeah, whoever wrote the code managed to give it the ability to, to go to a text and analyze it and to extract from it the sense of syntax so it can write like shakespeare or possibly even like dylan thomas by the way you may not know this but there is software called zero gpt and if you put uh, text into it it will tell you whether it's likely written by a human oh yes, or by yes. Artificial intelligence. okay yes, yes. Now, the only problem with that is i once asked it to write for an article i asked i wondered whether it could write a limerick about microscopes and it wrote an appalling limerick. It didn't even scan. It had a certain assonance, but it didn't actually rhyme. And I dropped that into a zero GPT, and it said, this was written by a person, not by artificial <laughs> intelligence. So <laughs> even when it comes to diagnostic software, you can't necessarily rely on it. No. Well, no. I, I can say that that um, I, I, I use chat GPT quite regularly because I, I teach in um, Afrikaans, mostly because most of my learners are Afrikaans speaking and I find that they sometimes struggle with more advanced YouTube videos so what I do I use chat GPT to translate um, the to the transcription of a YouTube video about whatever scientific or historic subject it might be and then it saves me a lot of time that I, I do have to do some Afrikaans language um, I have to fix up the language it's not perfect but it's it saves me maybe half an hour to to just ask chat gpt to translate the text and then i just have to do some linguistic tidying up so am i right in thinking that afrikaans is old dutch um afrikaans is now it's derived from dutch but it's not seen as old dutch it's now seen as a totally different dialect of dutch but yes you're right it's it's basically um the reason i say that is this you can hear them speak Norman French in Guadeloupe in the in the Caribbean. Because oh, because it didn't change. And I have always had a fantasy that somebody who was versed in Afrikaans could read the letters of Antony van Leeuwenhoek, the microscope pioneer. Yeah. Because mm. of the fact that he was writing in the 17th century. And yeah. it's from 17th century Dutch that Afrikaans originally. Well, we, we probably would. Idea on my part. We probably yeah. would be able to. I, I, I think the biggest struggle would be to, to understand the script because to me that's always the most difficult. But we probably would be because, um, but, but Afrikaans has has changed a lot as well. So, so yes. um, for example, I can't read Dutch. Um, so, so I, I can I can recognize some of the words, but I 
I can read it and I, I understand the gist of things, but no. but it's uh, the the two languages have really um, grown diverged. Yes. Di di diverged quite quite considerably. Yes, yes. yes. But well, um, we can't rely we, we can't rely on uh, other derivatives from a parent language being sort of fossilized in in that old age version of the parent language as they will be changing in their own volition as well. Um, for example, American English uses the word gotten, which mm. was something that the Pilgrim Fathers would have used, but we've long since dropped it. Meanwhile, of course, American English has in introduced a lot of other new words that we've had to cotton on to here. So they're, well, all, they're all changing in their own, both forwards and backwards. Too. I remember in the 70s, um, being at a meeting in Brussels and the chap who I was with had spent his student years in Sweden mm. the delegate there from Ocala, so I introduced them and he chatted to her for a while and afterwards I said how is it Swedish and she said it was very good she said but it's such old-fashioned Swedish yes, and I thought yes. I can't quite understand that now I mean I'm 84 now and now when I hear broadcasts from the 1950s it sounds, yes. and now I know what that girl meant, it sounds yes. like such an incredibly antiquated tongue. In fact, the yes. earliest recording of me uh, doing radio and television back in the 60s, I yes. would hardly recognize them as being my own accent because the, the, yes, the, yes, the yes. language has evolved and changed so much, yet it has. Yes. Yes, but, but Brian, in, in Afrikaans, what's interesting, so um, if, if I read books that I remember devouring as a youngster when I was 15, 16. And I actually came across one of my favorite books the other day at a secondhand bargain bookshop or something. And I bought it for five rand and I was so excited and I opened it up and it was like a foreign language to me. It, it was, wow. it, and, and that's the written like language. It was, I really, it, it, it's uncanny how very rapidly of the written Afrikaans, um, not to mention the spoken Afrikaans. I mean, the tone and the register changes because we less formal, but mm. I do not find the same with English. I mean, you can read English from the 1980s and, and English today, that it's basically this written English is to a great extent the same, but Afrikaans has changed so much. It's it's almost a different language. Well, well um, Swedish has changed a lot, you see, in that couple of decades. Some languages do. Now, yes. my it, favorite book when I was little was a book that you you can't publish now called Little Black Sambo. Yes. It was all about I, have, a black I know family. that book. And I know I that book. Adored the family. I mean, I mean, the father was so hard working. The mother always mm. had a clean house and meals on time. And a yes. little black Sambo lived the most idyllic life. And I thought, uh, how I wished yes. I could have lived a life like that little black boy. <laughs> how much I loved the idea. Now, of course, mm. people turn around and say, oh, you couldn't possibly say that. That's just no. history and race. No, it's, it's yeah. history. That's what it is. Yes. Well, well, well I don't remember that book. Well, guys, I'm going to have to draw this to a close because uh, traditionally, in whatever language we are using, Free Thought Hour is an hour, and we've just completed it. So I'd like to announce that next week we're going to take time off. <clears throat> this is because there's a thing going on here in the UK called a coronation, and it, it ends with a concert outside Buckingham Palace featuring stars from around the world, and I don't think we can compete with our little show. So come back and watch us next week, that, the week after, that will be May the 13th, when we have another fabulous guest. Who is it? Let me have a look, see in my diary. Who is it on the May the 13th? It is Tim Bollins, who is back. He visited us a couple of weeks ago and talked about his theory of consciousness which goes right back to the beginning. He thinks molecules have consciousness. Wow. No, oh, I must tell you something. You mentioned mm -hmm. you mentioned the coronation. Yeah. Um, they have removed the Cohen or Diamond from the crown 
in case Have it offends the Indians from which it was obtained. Oh, um, that's today, good. apparently, the descendants of the people who presented the diamond to Queen Victoria as a token of respect yeah. are deeply offended that it's not going to be in the crown <laughs> because they're so proud of the fact that they gave it to an English monarch and they wanted to see it on display at the coronation. But because some idiots good. are thought in the yes, woke yeah. era thought we'd better yes, not offend yeah. anyone, they removed it. In fact, the exact opposite is the truth. Yes. You've offended them because well, he removed it. I think it's going to be in the Queen's crown, isn't it? I, I think I really wouldn't know. Yeah, John. John, before we before we say goodbye, um, it was also Tim Bolland who introduced us to Professor Brian J. Ford. Yeah. And can I can I ask here in public that um, that Professor Brian owes us another thirty minutes that we could perhaps make it up sometime because yeah. I am extremely curious to find out about those microscopes um, in the background because I my trusty friend. I would love to know about your work. And you said that you had a lab, a, you, you opened a lab, and I'd like to know what you did research on. And I mean, I don't know many people who have, what is it, five um, that I can see, five microscopes, just there sort of on your on your countertop. So I'm very curious about that. Um, so would you would you arrange with John to, to give us another half an hour of your life, <laughs> maybe some other time? Please come back. Yeah, Okay, I shall. Thank you. That's Great. your punishment for forgetting about us tonight. I know. I, well, I'd love to give you a fancy excuse, but there we are. <laughs> very nice to meet you both, and good night. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming. And thank you, thank you for Brian. Watching. Thank you. Say bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye.